Oh, praise God. We're sharing at the, uh, you know, we, we've seen the things there from uh, the week of prayer there from the Methodist Church. I want to encourage you. God is stirring his church up across the nation. There has never been a time of more prayer. We'll get onto that in, in a minute, just, just gives a couple of minutes. We'll get, there's never been such a time. We started the year with a week of prayer. I didn't know there was going to be another week of prayer from Rochdale Town Centre, which was joining with a national week of prayer. Then Dave sent this thing from Littleborough Churches Together to say there's a week of unity of prayer uh, across the churches together. Uh, churches are doing 21 days of prayer. It's, it's absolutely, absolutely, it'll do them good. Uh, but there's never been so much prayer. And I want to encourage the church, you know, we, we pray and pray. Don't think that prayer is a waste of time. The reason why the church is full today is through prayer. Let's be clear. The reason why the church is strong is through prayer. I shared this at the leaders. We have a revival prayer meeting every uh, last Thursday of a month. And I shared this with them. Uh, somebody else was sharing. But we have the week of prayer in Rochdale. Listen to this. This is John Wesley in the 1700s. 1774. John Wesley in 1774 said, At noon I preached in Rochdale. Whoa! And in the evening he went to somewhere called Huddersfield. Two years later, he says, after preaching in Bury, I went to Rochdale and I preached in the evening to a numerous but deeply serious set of Christians. Wow! Who thought Rochdale was deeply serious? <laughs> Two years later, I preached in Bury and then for the rest of the day, I preached in Rochdale. Monday, tw six years later, 12th of August, I went and I preached in Bury at about one. And in the evening, I went to Rochdale. Now was the day of visitation for this town of Rochdale. The people were all so on fire. Never before has a fire been kindled in my life, chiefly through the prayer meetings. This is the great John Wesley. Never before had he seen the fire of God move than he has in Rochdale. Amen? A hundred years later, another guy, William Orr, Peter shared this, he came. What is it about this town of Rochdale? They are on fire for God. Okay? And I believe... Some 150 years later, in 2023, God is saying, what is it about Rochdale? Come on! What is it about Wardle? Never before have I seen a people pray. So church, pray. Pray, and then when you've prayed, pray again. And when you've prayed again, pray again. Pray again for a sovereign revival. Don't pray that our hearts will just be fluttered. Don't just pray that I'll have a little bit of a feeling. That may sound good, but never has the fire burned so brightly. So come on, church. This is the time, this is the season, I believe. God is saying, pray once again. You know, we've got our first of our regular prayer meeting again on Friday night. That will come on the 12th. I didn't want to cloud some of the notices. But we're going to pray on the Friday deliberately before we go away for the weekend. Because we're going to pray for such a move of God that as we're away and whatever is going to move again. So on the 12th, is it 10th, is it? Thank you. Whatever Fridays, it doesn't really matter. You'll guess the Fridays. Forget dates. We're praying again. Oh, and if, it, you know, we're only at the end of the first month. Okay, well, we're nearly at the end. I don't even know what date it is. But we're near the end. It feels near the end of January. Uh, this party's been going on, so I, I get that. If you've been here and listening, you can't have helped hear God's message already. It started, didn't it, where I was sharing, you know, that what we are seeing now was birthed from the day when God planted the church and he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. I told you then that God is doing now what he promised to do. And he's told us that we've got to be wise and not foolish Christians. 
We've got to feast upon his word, yeah? And we've got to be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit if we are going to be on fire. And then Karen sent me this from Wesley. That is the truth. Wayne came and he didn't know anything about what's been going on in the church except for the grove. What's the first thing he said? God is telling you, abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, abide in me. So God is saying, remain, abide, church, pray. Adam came and he shared with us, didn't he? He took us on that journey through Exodus. Very quickly as he was going, he was saying, listen, God's promises are true. This word is alive. We can trust in it. We can be faithful in it. As we are faithful, God speaks. And when he makes a promise, it is yes and amen. And so you can see God is saying to us, come on church, now is the time to abide. Now is the time to get grips. Now is the time to be wise. And we're going to follow that with uh, some readings this week and next week from Colossians. And this first one is up there on the board. This is the NIV. If you do have your Bibles and your tablets and your scrolls and whatever else, uh, please look it up. It's always good. I tend to bring the, the, the scripture anyway so that you know where I'm reading from. But turn to Colossians chapter 1. Verse 9 says this. Do I read it here or on here? That's easy enough. Since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped. We have not stopped what? Praying. We've not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Holy Spirit gives. Wow. Wow. Bit of context, Paul hadn't planted the church there and the Colossians he's writing to. He hadn't planted that. Somebody else had done that, Epaphras, and had planted that church. But he said, I've heard of you. And if Paul was alive today, I believe he could write to us and say, I didn't plant you at branches, but I've heard what's going on. I've heard what's going on in branches. I've heard how God is drawing people to you. I've heard how God is building the family. None of you are here by mistake. God is building you into this family because he wants us to move into his knowledge and his will. And so please encourage more because there's more to come in this family. This isn't it. This is good. But listen, there's more of this family coming in. There's more of this family and we'll work out where to fit them, don't worry. We'll work out where to fit them, that's God's, that's God's plan. But there's more coming in. Big, big, big. Big, big, amen. Amen. Big, big, big. All other good ones can sit on front row here, that's good news. Big, big, big. But it says, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of his will. His will how through the understanding and wisdom that only God the Holy Spirit gives us when we're filled with the Holy Spirit and that's how God wants to encourage us this day this very morning as he's saying abide in us and we're going to look at these three aspects of knowledge wisdom and understanding you may say well well why does he want that well praise God Paul must have had that question straight away in his head because the very next verse tap the screen or whatever you do, it says, so that, get hold of this church, you and I can live a life worthy of God. <laughs> the God who built all this, the God who flung a few stars into space, so many that we're still baffling the scientists and they're trying to count them and discuss them. And he says, oh, I can lob a few more in if you want. I've got bucketfuls. I got bucketfuls. He knows them by name. <laughs> How about that? But he says, you and I can live a life worthy of him. Just imagine that. Living a life worthy of the living God, pleasing him. We've spoke about that, haven't we? That God delights in us. God sings over you and me. That's awesome. You don't look too happy. I'm great when God sings over me. Never mind Britain's got talent. Never mind that lot. I've got the whole creator God singing over this little lump of flesh, what weighs about 12 and a bit stone, okay? And he says, bang! 
I'm singing over you, Howard. Oh, praise God. Thank you. Thank you. He says, your voice is a bit off, Howard, but trust me, I'm singing. I'm singing good for you. And that we can bear fruit, church. Again, John 15, why do we abide in him? So we will bear fruit. Fruit in our own lives, and then as it flows through our own lives, which are transformed, fruit into others. So please be encouraged to be a fruit bearer. Be encouraged to invite people. To invite people to come. To invite people. Share the gospel. Don't be, don't be scared. Don't be confused. Just say, come along. The worst they can say is no. And then they'll know a couple of weeks later, you're going to say, come along again. <laughs> come along again. Because God is here. That we will bless him and we will grow in the knowledge. So we're going to unravel this in the next half hour. Uh, if what I don't finish today, I may pick up next week, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. And the first place I'm going to start is not with those three words. The first place I'm going to start is with the word fill. All right? Now today, on the next set of slides, we're going to try and show you a few Greek words. Not to try and impress you that I know Greek, because I don't. Not to try and persuade you that I can pronounce these Greek words, if anybody can you're welcome, set the stage on these things. But because that when we look into some of these Greek words, this is how the original New Testament was written. Don't go on to that one. Don't go on to that. Stay back where you are. When we go on to some of these uh, words, you will find they have a richer meaning than the English language just says. And that's what you always get. You know, we, we, we all know in English we have a word called love. But actually... When you look at it in Greek, they can, depending upon who you want to talk to about pure Greek, etc., etc., et there's between five and seven words, which actually the Greek use for love, and they're in the Bible. We just say love. And it's the same with some of these. So I want to we're going to try and go through them. I'm going to say teach you them. I'm not, because how I pronounce it, Rochdale Greek to me. But listen. The fire of God's in Rochdale, so <laughs> this could be God's pronunciation. So this first word, filled, it's not on a slide, but you can hit, listen to it. It's actually a word that they probably pronounce something like playroy. Playroy, okay? Uh, and it literally means to be filled so full you can't fit any more in. So we may say, I filled a cup of coffee, and then we leave that gap at the top, don't we? We go to a pub... And, and, and we get a pint, and they say, I've filled the glass. And you say, no, you haven't. What's that at the top there? What's that? But we know they still give the pint, because it's a pint measure and whatever else. But filled doesn't mean that. This filled says, you are so filled, there is not any bit left in your body. Paul says, I want you to be so filled, so stuffed. Don't think of a turkey at Christmas where you stuff it because you let a little bit of air. But you're so stuffed. Imagine a, a toy or a cushion that you so stuff it, there isn't room for any air. God want, Paul said, I want you to be so stuffed with his knowledge. Your very fingertips, your very toes, your very, it'd be oozing out of every crevice. Whatever. We haven't getting to that. But he wants you to be so stuffed with the knowledge of God. Do you get it? That this is the filling. It's not a partial filling. It's not a filling we get by just dipping. It's not a filling, as I was saying last time, by being foolish and a bit haphazard. It's the filling we get through being wise, through seeing. He says, I want you to be so stuffed full. So imagine whatever picture you want, that we'd all walk out of here like Michelin men, for those of us who are a bit older, stuffed with the knowledge and the fullness of God's wisdom and understanding. All right? Of this fluffy, big creature <laughs> that goes on. So that's the first part. Now, having said we want to be filled, let's move on. Knowledge. Let's get it up, up there on the Greek. It took me ages to write that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could have. But like I was saying, there are many versions. So let's begin. You can look at that, but let's start. Because knowledge has various levels. There's a first level of knowledge that both the Hebrew, that's the Old Testament, and the Greek in the New Testament talks. And the first one, it talks about a head knowledge. Okay? Now in the Hebrew, this is a word 
I'm sure our Iranians can pronounce this a lot better than me, but it's something like dihat. Okay, dihat. That's the Hebrew word. The Greek word is gnosis. And what it means is it's a head knowledge. It's about facts. You have a head knowledge of something. So Adam mentioned last week, it is a fact that God parted the Red Sea. That's a fact, that's a head knowledge. For some of us who were old like me and 60 and went in at school in those times, all our learning was fact-based. You weren't given an answer book with formulas. No, you had to learn all the formulas. You had to know them in your mind off road. You knew A squared equals B squared plus C squared, blah, 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 yeah? Okay, you knew all the different theories. You knew in 1066 there was something called the Battle of Hastings for those people who, went to, who had to do history and whatever else. But this is the head knowledge. It's all based on facts. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. There are loads of facts in the Bible. The fact is, God created the earth. That's a fact which we need to know. The fact is, you were made in the image of God. It's a fact that you need to know. You're not a mistake. You're not an accident. God literally knitted you in your mother's womb. These are facts, but this is the head knowledge. That makes sense? And the Bible is full of those facts, and that's good. But you see, just having a head knowledge is not what Paul's saying. We don't just need a head knowledge of God. Because you see, just having a head knowledge of God doesn't bring across the transformation that God wants in our lives. Loads of people have head knowledge. There are loads of non-Christians who've got a deeper, greater depth of head knowledge than I will ever ascertain because they are far, far, far cleverer than me. I'm not putting myself down. That's just a fact. All right? <laughs> I have no problems with that. But the head knowledge is not enough, but it's a good start. All right? So if you've got good head knowledge, amen. Right? That's a good start. But then there's a second level or a second depth to knowledge that Paul says and the Bible says. And this is based upon a sort of experience. And so we call it an experience knowledge. So it's not just facts that you've read, you've experienced some. And it can come from like a relationship. Yeah? So part of knowing and having knowledge is also related to skills. So I can say, I know that Ian can do stuff with wood. I know that by fact. How do I know it? Because I've experienced it because he's kindly given me some of the great crafts he's made. Yeah? So there's an experience aspect also built in the Bible. And the word here, in the Hebrew, this is their second word they have, it's yada. I love it. Y-A-D-A. Yada. Yada da da. Yada. It just means knowledge. Okay? But it means this knowledge that is built based also, not just head knowledge, it's gone deeper because it's been experienced. They've tasted it, they've seen it. It could be built from a relationship. The Greeks use a word, and I'll totally pronounce this one wrong, ginosko, uh, for theirs. But it means this. And if you look at ginosko in the, in the Strongs, it says it's also a Jewish idiom for Adam knew Eve. Now, we're all adults here, except for a few kids, and they don't mind because they are far too young. So when it says Adam knew Eve, doesn't mean he had a head knowledge about her, because the very next sentence is, they had two kids. Do you get it? <laughs> Adam knew Eve. Yeah? Howard knows Jan. Don't need to go any deeper, sums in. Howard knows Jan. Children appear. Right? So there's a depth of knowledge that is experiential. Right? That is also based on those. And so God is saying here, Paul is saying, I want you to be filled with this. Now what some people mightn't know is that actually an awful lot of the Greek words we have in modern day Greek were actually came from when they were writing the Bible. Because they didn't exist. Okay? They didn't exist when they were writing some. And if I've done right in this, and I've, I've, I've tried to search on various Greek sites, and it seems to tie up, Paul was so saying, I want you to have much more of a knowledge, even than this knowledge, which is based upon experience and relationship. I want you to have such a knowledge that is more than facts. And so he penned this word, epi, 
epignosis. Or as they pronounce it, I think, epignosis or something. But I'll call it epignosis because it sounds good to me. Right? And that comes from this Greek word, epi, epi, which Paul says, and Greek is saying, is far above. And so what Paul is saying is, I want you to have a knowledge that is far above head knowledge, that is far above just simply experience. I want you to have a knowledge that is far above all knowledge about God. And that knowledge above all knowledge, this epigenosis knowledge, can only be obtained through an encounter with God and a continual encounter. Because it's based not just on a simple experience, on a simple relationship, it's based on such a deep knowledge, it's based on such a radical encounter that your life is transformed each time you're meeting with God. Each time. We shouldn't just have a one-off encounter with God. Paul had a one-off encounter with God that transformed his life. It didn't stop there. The fire kept on burning. The lamp kept on burning. The spirit was upon him. And he's saying today, church, branches, I want you to be so filled, filled far above filling of the knowledge of God's will for you and this fellowship. He wants you to be pressed in, pressed full of this knowledge which only comes about through an encounter. You have this guy called Nicodemus, rabbi upon rabbi. He was one of the leaders, wasn't he? Came to Jesus at night time. Cut short the story because of time. Jesus says, listen, let's cut through all this knowledge. You are a man who knows the scripture. You are a man who knows every ritual. You have experienced the rituals. You've encountered, but listen, you must be born again. This is the knowledge that we have to come into, church. It's the radical transformation. When God spoke my name, it wasn't simply that I experienced God. He totally transformed my life. And each and every day for the subsequent 30 years, today God is transforming my life. And God is saying today, Howard, I want you to be filled far above knowledge. Why? Because when I have this, my whole life sets on fire. Does that make sense? It's not simply I can say, it is written. I can say, it is written because I've experienced it. So get behind me, Satan. You have no hold on me. My prayer life comes along. This is the prayer life that Wesley's talking about. It's the prayer life that was. Why? Because I'm not calling into an empty vacuum when I'm praying. My knowledge is God's in this house. God is in this physical room now. Have you that knowledge? God is not condemning you if you're not. But what he's saying is, listen church, listen family. If I could drag you in there, I physically would. But I can't. But he's saying, come on. Be filled with this knowledge of God. It's available for each and every one of us. It's available for the babies. The fullness of this knowledge. You get it? This knowledge above knowledge. And God's saying he wants to set you on fire with this knowledge. Our prayer life comes. We don't get tossed around. You know, when all these influences, I keep on telling you about, what a nonsense statement. When all these people come around giving you this, giving you that, you're not influenced because you know that you know that you know that you know because you've tasted and seen how good God is. Amen. We're feasting upon the word and we say, what, what did you say? You said, don't say that in the word, rubbish. Church, that's, that's, that's it. Is what you're saying, world, is what you're saying, Howard, this day, does it align with the word? If the answer is yes, amen. If the answer is no, bin that. I'm not even going to give it a second thought. I haven't got time to give rubbish a second thought because I'm pressing on into the full knowledge of God. So let's drop the rubbish and let's feast upon him. And he says, I want you to know the knowledge, not of anybody's will, but his will. And then he says, I want you to grab hold of this with the understanding and wisdom that comes from the Holy Spirit. This is an awesome thing because you see the next thing he says is, armed with this knowledge, 
Even that is not enough to radically transform you and keep you in that place. That's amazing, isn't it? Because you see, so many of us it says, well, I encountered God 20 or 30 years ago. No, no, no. How would I encounter God 30 years ago? Did I encounter God this morning when I woke up? That's what's important, church. Did I en encounter God this morning? Have you encountered God in our worship? Have you encountered God as we are preaching now? Or are we being distracted by the things of the world and whatever else? Because God says, this is what it's about. Because I want to take it from that, just that knowledge. And he says, I want to give you understanding. I want to bring it into understanding. So what's the difference? Let's throw the next page up. Again, the good old Greeks and the Hebrews have different words. The Hebrew word for understanding is something called tabuna. And it's associated with this word and a couple of other Greek words, but this one mainly called, they say it's pronounced, suesis. I'd say synesis, but he says sunesis. Okay, and seeing as they're Greek, well, I will go for theirs. Okay, but it says he wants you to have this understanding. Because you see, what understanding does, it takes knowledge and it brings meaning. Does that make sense? It brings a meaning out of those facts. It means it brings a meaning out of that relationship. It brings a personalization to it. It makes it personal to me. It brings revelation. This is what understanding brings, yeah? It brings revelation of what's happening. So he says, I don't just want you to be filled with knowledge, but I want you to understand. I don't want you to just have the knowledge of God's will for your life, but I want you to understand it. I want you to take hold of it. I want it to bring revelation to it. I want it to become alive. And facts become alive when we understand them. Teaching is only ever good when it brings understanding. Make sense? And so God says, I want you to understand this, not with a human understanding, but with the understanding that the Spirit brings, because this is a spiritual word. And he says, I want you to be filled with this clear understanding, this revelation of what God's saying, this revelation that makes it personal. So the fact says, Jesus Christ died for sin. Yeah? He died for the sin of all 7.8 billion people alive today, they reckon about 7.8 billion people have already lived. Yeah, however many. So let's just say 20 billion. He died for that. That's what fact says. Understanding says, he died for me. He took away my sin. Yeah, to get this? Fact says that Jesus Christ was born of a woman. Fact says Jesus Christ shed his blood for the world. Fact says, Howard, you're a sinner because you've rejected God. You've turned away. You're selfish. Fact says, Howard, you should be under condemnation. Fact says, you should be under guilt. But understanding says, no, because Jesus Christ went to the cross. I am set free. Amen? <laughs> understanding says, no, I am free. I am no longer a sinner. I am a saint. This is what understanding brings. Do you get it, church? And so often we can be muddling in the, in the facts here and the knowledge and God says, no, I want you to have understanding. And so many of us struggle in our Christian walk because we haven't moved into the place of understanding. We read that God sets people free when actually what God says is, I set you free, Howard. Ho, ho, ho. Whoa. Yeah, but God, I'm not... Can you do this with me? No, listen. Understanding says, Howard, you are no longer under condemnation. Whoa. Amen. Fact says, do not worry, do not fear, don't carry anxiety. Understanding says, I can walk tall because I'm not carrying the weights of the world and the burdens of the world on my shoulders. Does that make sense, church? But that only understanding can only come through God the Holy Spirit. This is why we've got to be filled and cram filled daily with the Holy Spirit. Because each and every day, I need to take this knowledge, I need to take the things that I've tasted and seen, not relying on what happened last week, but relying on today and say, today I've tasted and seen how good God is. Today, you and I were involved in one of the greatest miracles ever. Who knows that? 
Did you know that? You were, you, were, you were involved in the greatest miracle. How many of us today have woke up and said, thank you, Lord, for the greatest miracle ever? Have you said that? Some of you are looking at me and thinking, it passed me by, Howard. I overslept. Listen, the greatest miracle in your life and my life this very day is that you woke up and you weren't in hell. Do you know that? God literally holds your breath, Howard's breath, in the palm of his hand. The fact that I woke up this morning means he didn't allow me to die. The fact that I woke up this morning meant I could taste and see how good God's kingdom is this day. Not be taken away this day. And he said, Howard, I'm giving you another miracle of another day of your life to worship me. And you have had that greatest miracle available to you today. Have you woke up and given thanks for it? Today, you're involved in the greatest miracle. And yet you may walk out of here and say, oh, I, I can't remember the last time. I can't remember the last time I saw a miracle. <laughs> you're a walking miracle. Yes, you may say, but I'm not so sure. I don't believe in God. It doesn't matter. You're alive. You're a walking miracle. And God says, come into the revelation and understanding of what he's done and the reason you and I are alive is for one reason only to please him and to bear fruit that's why, that's why we're alive church because listen when God's finished with Howard and he's talking and whatever else I'm trying to do in me encouraging that he'll say come home and I'll say Whoa, amen amen but the fact that you and I are alive today is a great miracle. And he says, the miracle is because I want you to know his will. The great miracle, he wants you to understand that God is for you. Not just in words. Not just the head knowledge that we sing. We're saying, do you know that you know that you know? Have you tasted and seen this very day that God is for you? I say yes, because you're alive. And you haven't been cast anywhere out of his way. Wow, what an understanding. And we can see that time is running out. I've got 10 more minutes. Time's running out. The Bible is full of it. For logical thinkers like me, which sometimes does get in the way, so I don't recommend it all the time. But the Bible's full of it. How do I know? Because the Bible uses a great term, both in the Hebrew and the Greek. And it's this great word called, therefore. Therefore. And it doesn't matter if it's in the Old Testament, the New Testament, Jesus used it. Great writer Paul used it. You'll find it in the, in the Old Testaments with the prophets. And what they were basically saying, this is God, that is God, this is God, that is, therefore. And that's the understanding, right? So let me just give you a couple of examples. You've got homework. Get hold of YouTube or YouTube, Uvision or whatever Bible app you use and whatever else. Do a search for therefore and, and master it yourself. I'm just going to paraphrase it because of time. Psalm 16, get hold of this. Get hold of this, right? Knowledge and understanding. Get hold of this. David says, In God, I take refuge. Fact. Okay? God, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have nothing. Fact is, all those who look to other gods will get depressed and ultimately die and end up in hell. These are the fact, this is the knowledge. Yeah? This is what he keeps on saying. Let me go back to my words. Looking over his specs. He says, Lord, you give me a delightful inheritance. John spoke about adoption. If you haven't seen it, get hold of it on web. Awesome. You give me an explosive. Lord, you counsel me. With God at my right hand, I will not be shaken. <laughs> right? So he gives all this knowledge out. He says, I've experienced this. And then he says, therefore. Oh, ho, ho. this is the good part. This is the good part. This is what David's come into. David says, therefore, my heart is glad. My tongue rejoices. I am secure. Church, the world is wrestling because it doesn't know what security is. But you see, when we take hold of God in knowledge and we apply understanding, I can say, I'm secure. 
But Howard, how can you be secure? What about these things what are going on in the world? What about these problems what are going on? What about this what's happening with so and so? What about these people who are persecuting you? No! I am secure because God is for me. God has not abandoned me. I am inheritance in God and I am secure. And so many Christians feel insecure because we haven't entered into the understanding. We've got some facts here and we say, but God, you're the God who, who doesn't bring chaos. God, you're... And we live in a knowledge. And God says, well, if I am the God of order and I have brought order, then you will know chaos no longer matters. Because chaos doesn't define Howard's life. Trust me, around Howard's life, there can be all chaos. Look at the world. No, seriously. But not one of that influences the order in my life. Why? Because I've come into the understanding that God is the God of order. And he said, I placed you, Howard, far above all that rubbish. <laughs> but we've got to come into the understanding, church. Paul says this. Oh, time. Why does time have to go so quick? 1 Corinthians, we'll, we'll shut this down even more, even quicker. He says, in Jesus, God has revealed the fullness of his grace to each one of us. 1 Corinthians 1. That's a fact. Jesus is the revelation of God's grace and love in the fullness. What does that mean? It means that although I deserve the punishment, although I deserve the guilt, although I deserve the condemnation because I was a sinner and I rejected God and I wasn't for God and I put God at an arm's length because I wanted my own way and I wanted to do my own things and God's will didn't matter, God's church didn't matter, my will mattered, mine, I deserve punishment. But then God says, Howard, you can't sort this out, so I'm going to send my son, Jesus Christ. Here's the gospel. And Jesus came and he took all that guilt. He took all my shame. He took all your shame, all your sin, all your pain, all your addictions, all your things of darkness and everything. And it was laid upon him. 20 billion souls laid upon Jesus Christ. All their guilt, all their shame, all their darkness laid upon him. And he rose again. <laughs> Trashed it at the cross. Trashed it. Don't just think he won. Trashed it. If there could be a scoreline of 90 nil, it wouldn't be big enough. More than a goal a minute. <laughs> Trashed. Trashed it at the cross. That's the grace of God. I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. He just poured it out. Fact number one in God. Fact number two, Paul says this. He says, in Christ Jesus, the God of grace, in Jesus who is flesh, when I commit my life to him, listen to this. He takes off his specs. I have been enriched in every way. Wow. Wow. This 60-year-old bald-headed guy has been enriched in every single way. Because I'm in Christ Jesus. There's nothing about me that I haven't been enriched. Why? Because my sins have been taken away. <laughs> I don't stand condemned. I don't carry the weight of the world. The only weight I carry at the moment is this. this. Can't help that one. Yeah? But I don't carry these things. Therefore, Paul says, get hold of this. If it is true that I have been enriched in every way, get hold of this, Paul says, I lack no spiritual gift. Wow, well, one person thought it was great. Listen, church, when you come into the understanding that God is grace, you've committed your life to Jesus Christ, your life has been enriched in every way, this is the knowledge, God says, don't stop there. Understand this, Howard. Understand this, Ian. Understand this, Henry. Understand this, family. You lack nothing. You lack no spiritual... Wow! I lack nothing. Just think of what that means. Oh, God, I've got a hard decision to take here. Hard decision to take. And we all have hard decisions, let's be right. Hard decisions about relationships. Hard decisions about jobs. Hard decisions about where to live. Hard decisions about how to spend our time. Hard decisions about how to spend our money. Loads of decisions. What does God say? I lack nothing. 
Okay, God, if I lack nothing, give me the gift of discernment. Give me the gift of discernment right now, Lord, to make the right choice. That is available to you and I now. You and I never need to make the wrong choice. Do you get that? It's amazing. But you only get into that place when you've got understanding. Knowing that God is full of grace, knowing that in him you've been enriched, doesn't set you free. When you say, but I like no gift, and I'm not knocking coming for me for prayer, please. We need prayer for each other. I started deliberately by saying prayer. But listen, most of our problems are caused because we don't come into the, these understandings. Therefore, you have been enriched in every way. Therefore, you lack no spiritual gift. Do you understand that? Who here lacks a spiritual gift? Who here has all spiritual gifts? Are we listening? Oh, well. But do you, get the, do you get the point? Time's running. Oh, let's move quickly. Because he then turns round. Jesus said one, and I'll give you that one maybe next week, I may feel that. But just then there, he says, because with, gift, with the knowledge and understanding, I now want you to use wisdom. And all wisdom means is, he wants you to use godly wisdom to apply this knowledge and understanding to every single situation of your life. Wow. God will give you the wisdom. And the reason why God is saying this about you and encouraging us to press on and take hold is that not only you, but when people come to you, you will then apply this godly knowledge, understanding and wisdom in their lives. And they will be set free. Do you understand it? And this wisdom is how to apply this. When Solomon was asking and being told, what do you want? Solomon said, give me a discerning heart. Give me a heart of understanding. In the Hebrew, this translated discerning or understanding. A perceptive heart. Give me an understanding heart to govern your people. Listen, as elders, I want to assure you, we constantly ask God for this. Give us a, an understanding heart because this Family at branches are your people, God. They're not mine. I can't save you. Yeah? Don't follow me. You can imitate me by all means. You can follow my prayer. <laughs> Go for it. But I can't save you. And we ask for understanding of how to govern, how to lead you, how to distinguish between right and wrong. This is what understanding and wisdom does. He says, for who is able to govern this great people? The Lord was pleased with Solomon that he asked for this. And so God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or for wealth for yourself, and you've not asked for the death of your enemies, that's where I'd, how would it have fallen short? I'd have said, give me wisdom, God, but slaughter them. <laughs> he already had a bit of wisdom. He says, you didn't ask for the death, but for discernment in administering. I will do what you ask and not only will I give you all wisdom, I will give you all understanding and knowledge so that there will never be another person ever born. Listen, Tesla's clever, Bill Gates is clever, a lot. there will never be a greater wise person than Solomon. <laughs> and God bestowed it upon him. The wisdom to administer and God's saying, listen, through Paul, he's saying, listen, Branches family, I want you to be stuffed with this wisdom. Wow. Stuffed with this wisdom so that you're not floundering, you're not panicking, you're not anxiety, you're not in fear, you're not in doubts. But God, I call for your wisdom and understanding in this situation. And in that way, we set free, church. We set free because we've moved from a place of knowledge what says, but this is me. God has set Howard free. God has given Howard wisdom. God has said, Howard, you lack no spiritual gift. God has said, Howard, I am for you. And we can walk in these promises without doubt, without fear. And that's the message this morning as we just finish. Because God is saying, listen, church, the reason I'm saying abide in me is that he wants to take us to this place where we will be so filled with knowledge above knowledge about God. We'll be so filled with godly understanding and godly wisdom. You see, the alternative, let's be clear, is worldly knowledge, worldly understanding and worldly wisdom. 
And I'm not even going to give it time to develop. All you need to do is look out through those doors when you walk away. This is what happens when the world is, follows worldly wisdom, worldly understanding and worldly knowledge. Wars, rumours of wars, death, injustice, the list goes on. Anxiety, fear, pain, hurt, bitterness. We know what happens. Now then, if you live and you apply that understanding, what fruit are you going to bear? You're going to bear fruit that is bitter, you're going to bear fruit that is upset, you're going to bear fruit of pain, you're going to bear fruit of anxiety, you're going to bear fruit. Why? Because you're applying worldly. And as Jesus said, if you live in that place, if you take that fruit, that can be the only fruit that you will bear. But when you live filled with the Spirit, when you live as wise, when you press on, when you are filled with the knowledge of God, when you're filled with understanding, when you apply God's wisdom, what am I going to bear? I'm going to bear the fruit of the kingdom of God. Amen. And I'm going to walk in this place where I'm not under guilt, I'm not under condemnation, I'm not, trying, I'm not judged by the world, I'm not competing against the world, I'm not competing against anybody. Why? Because I live and I bear fruit for the kingdom of God, because I stand in the understanding and wisdom that God alone provides. And I lived in a job for 35 years that sought to apply this wisdom. When I packed in my job and I told them why I was packing in my job and whatever else, somebody said, Howard, we will miss your wisdom. Why? Because I was the only one who didn't apply this wisdom. He's gone to the toilet again. You guessed it. <laughs> God, God, give me wisdom. What am I going to say? What am I going to say in this situation? Yeah, he's gone. He's gone. He'll be back in a few minutes. Be back in a few minutes. Let's listen to what he's got to say. <laughs> Howard's took a break. <laughs> but listen, church, this is the message for us. And God is not doing this to, to condemn us. God is saying, listen, that's available to you and to me. And he's saying, do you want to live as wise people, on fire for God, that brings revival? And if you do, then you will feast upon the word. You will feast upon the word. You will ask God the Holy Spirit to give you the wisdom and understanding to apply that to you. Not just to say, that's what God did, that's what God does. Yeah? If God set so-and-so free, he set me free. And that's why God, because when we're in this place, then we can go to each other. And how we can come to you and say, listen, can you just pray with me? Can you pray for me? A stranger can walk past you in Asda and say, oh yeah, and before you know it, and bless you that some of you are like this. Yeah, you're like little magnets, aren't you? You sit there and you think, right, I'll have that. And before you know it, somebody's got alongside you and they'll start to tell you. Start to tell you, won't they? Praise God for that ministry. Don't, don't, praise God. But listen, you are filled with the understanding of God if you're walking. And just think how. All you need to do is speak one word into their life. Bang. Whoa! And they set free. That's why we're filled with this. This is not so that you can go on Britain's Got Talent and say, I've got the greatest wisdom. I've got the greatest knowledge. Because trust me, you won't have. <laughs> but this is so that we will bear fruit. This is so that you can live a life worthy of the living God. This is so that you can live a life that bears fruit. This is so that your joy will be complete. Who wants joy complete here? I want joy complete. I don't want to miss out. I want complete joy. How do I get complete joy? By seeing you folk. How do I get complete joy? By seeing folk in the estate. How do I get complete joy? Is by sharing the gospel. How do I get complete joy? I read this, and then all of a sudden I read the word therefore, and all of a sudden, half past seven in the morning, whoa, wow, wow. Because all this takes time and effort. We're just going to finish, and then we'll pray. Because you see, this whole insight, this whole knowledge, this whole understanding, I have got a deep level of understanding, yeah, and knowledge about Jan and vice versa. I didn't get that by meeting with her 
for two hours once a week. I didn't, did I? I got it by being with her. I got it by committing my life to her, spending time with her. I'm enriched because I did. Let's be clear. But I got the level of knowledge I've got about Jan and I don't understand everything about her. I probably never will, right? But I've got the level I've got now because I spend time. Not two hours on a Sunday. Listen, I got the level of knowledge about Jan because not only did I spend time with her, I didn't just spend time with her in a crowd. It's great to come to church, people. Great to come to church. And thou should never miss. This should be your priority. Family groups should be your priority. It is great to meet together. That's the command in the Bible. It's not an offer. It didn't say, don't stop meeting together if you feel like it. It's a command. It's a fact, right? It's one of the facts, right? But, as well as that, you spend time alone. And I got a knowledge of Jan by being alone with her. Church, we're not spending enough time alone with God. We're finding loads of excuses. Finding loads of excuses, but we're not spending enough time with the living God. Because when we spend more time with God, if Jesus needed to continually go up the mountainside and pray to his Father and come down filled with the Holy Spirit, so he said, your will, not my will, what do we need to do? I would say, possibly even a little bit more somehow. <laughs> he was the Son of God and he spent that time. I'm just a mere mortal, transformed, hey, hey. But we need to spend that time. So yes, we need to spend it corporately. Please, this is not saying, well, I'll miss Sunday morning so I can go out for a picnic with Jan. No. This says Sunday morning is critical because I need to be with the family. I need to be with the family and share understanding, share knowledge, share relationships, share fun, share joy, share celebration. I need to be with the family group to share this, share that. But then, on top of that, I need to go and spend time alone and say, God, does that make sense? And some today is we're just going to pray and then we'll finish. Because some here today, you've got a good head knowledge. And like I said, please, God is not condemning you. God says, big tick, big, big tick. But he's saying there's some here today, you're staying in that place of knowledge. And God says, come, come and embrace understanding. Come and embrace wisdom, not worldly wisdom. This only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to invite you all to stand because I'm going to invite you to ask God the Holy Spirit to do this. I'm not going to lay hands on you. That's scriptural, please. There's nothing wrong in laying hands. It's just that I've only got two and there's about 90 of you. Right? So I'm going to invite you that if this word today to say, God, actually, I want to have knowledge far above knowledge about you. If you today want to say, God, I want understanding so deep about you and being personal to me that it transforms my life. God, I want your wisdom such that even this day, if you walked in here with anxiety, with burdens, with cares, with worries about work, with worries about family, with worries about health, I want you to tell you, today, God can set you free. Today, God is calling you and me to stand on his understanding. Whether you are physically healed or not, I believe God physically heals people, right? End of. I stand here as one. I'm interested in a greater miracle, I'll be honest. I'm interested in transformed lives. I don't care if I go into, into heaven lame. I want to be, end up in heaven, right? But listen... If you want prayer for healing physically, of course we will pray for that. We have seen it, I testify to it, I believe it, as in all miracles. But the greatest miracle of all, listen, is you having knowledge far above knowledge about the living God this day. That you have understanding that breaks all understanding. That you have wisdom for all understanding. So I'm going to pray. If you want to hold your hands up or whatever else, you can also ask. You know, and if you want to ask loudly, that's fine. I'm microphoned up. I can be loud, okay? But let's just ask. Let's call upon him. God, God, I want to thank you today 
that the Almighty God and your presence is amongst us. I want to thank you this day that you are calling us to say, know me, know me far above just head knowledge. Today God is saying to you, you can know him far above head knowledge, far above just a simple experience, but you can encounter the living God right now. Encounter the living God. Call out to him. Call out to him. Call out to him now and encounter him. Receive right now. Receive as if, as if you're getting the best gift because that's what you are getting right now. The best gift you will ever have. The kids yesterday were so excited over some of the presents that we're getting for the birthdays. Listen, you are getting the greatest gift of all. Know the living God. Receive right now. Holy Spirit, fill us. Fill us right now, I pray. Fill us right now with your understanding. There's some of you, you just lay that, ask for God's understanding. God will speak right now into your situation. That's the boldness that God is calling. That's the confidence I have in my God and the God who's in this house right now. That you can ask right now for understanding and wisdom and it will be stowed upon you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, be receiving this right now. Receive it right now. Receive it filled, filled into every part of your life. Commit your life again, I pray. If you haven't committed your life, I want to urge you right now, just tell God, I commit my life to you. Even if you have done, just declare again, Lord, this day I surrender, I commit my life to you. I will follow you and you alone, Lord. You are my Lord. You are my saviour. You are my healer. You are my deliverer. You are the one who taken away my sin. There is no condemnation because I'm in Christ Jesus. There are some of you carrying burdens and weights and loads that God has not placed upon you. Today, you can choose. Today, you can choose right now to lay them at the foot of Jesus Christ. Today, right now, right now, physically, take it off you. Take it off yourself and throw it away. There are people who need to do that right now. You are carrying a weight and a burden that you know is not of God. And God says, I, don't, I haven't called you to carry that weight. Cast it upon me, Jesus says. Cast it upon him. Hallelujah. Be released right now. Be released right now. Make the choices that you take from this day be filled with the knowledge and the understanding and wisdom of God Almighty. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen, church. Amen and amen. Rejoice in God. Listen, church, rejoice. Come on. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in his goodness. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. And remember... All glory, all honour, all praise goes to him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.